All right, seeing no objections. Okay, perfect. So welcome to the Victoria stop of the Need State of the Schools Tour in partnership with UVic Society for Students with a Disability. I'm putting down my script to make hard hands because you guys are so cool. Uh, so my incredible colleague, Elizabeth Moeller, will do some opening remarks in just a few moments, but I can't help but take the time to share how excited I am to be here. So when I first joined NEEDS as a research officer for a summer job, Julia Dudley and SSD was one of the very first disabled student groups I got to meet and work with. Um, and that really shaped my personal experiences, not just as a disabled student, but as now NEEDS communications and partnerships director. I loved it so much. I pursued the partnership section of NEEDS. So I'm really excited to be here today to learn from you all, to meet you where you are. So thank you so much for having us. So back to event info. First, thank you everyone for being with us today, whether you are online or in person, time and energy is so hard to come by and so hard to recover. Um, I personally know how draining events like these can be. They are so draining. Um, but I and the whole needs team really appreciate you showing up with us however you can today. So, you know, if you need to stim, if you want to take a walk, if you want to take a nap on your desk, please go for it. Uh, just do what you got to do to feel comfortable and safe. And we at Needs believe that online and in-person participation have unique but equal value. So our Zoom liaison, Aliyah petzak uh, is here today to just make sure that you are included. But if you ever feel excluded, um, you want to get more involved, please just literally unmute yourself. Let us know. We want to make sure you are equally involved. All right, so a few notes on our accessibility features today. We have real-time closed captioning available both through Zoom and stream text. The stream text link will be posted in the Zoom chat and captions are turned on for both our in-person and online participants today. Uh, we are joined by our American Sign Language interpreters, Vanessa, Sarah, and Cindy from Assign, previously known as Sign Language Interpreting Associates Ottawa. Congrats on the expansion. Uh, we'll have our interpreters spotlighted on Zoom so you can access them both online and in person. We do have accessible washrooms located pretty much straight out those doors. It's, it's a good location. It's a really good setup. Um, we also have pre-packed dinners for all in-person participants today, just in the back of the room um, and event staff, of course. Everybody eats. Um, so when eating, please try to be mindful of those around you, social distance if you can. And as part of our partnership with SSD, you guys are so cool. Um, we're providing food vouchers to online UVic student participants. So please fill out the Google form linked in the chat with your student email and student number. We will be in touch to get food vouchers out to you. And I'm just noting the other, perfect. All right, there we go. So again, just fill out the form and we will be in touch with a food voucher because again, equal value. All right, so for COVID-19 precautions, we ask that everyone wear a mask if they can. We want this to be a safe and inclusive space for everyone and that does include COVID safety. So hand sanitizer and masks are available at the registrant table and we will be doing contact tracing if you do end up contracting COVID-19 um, within five days of this event, which hopefully no one does. Like, anyways, um, please let me know at carly.fox at needs.ca uh, just so that we can let you know or let our participants know and we will be protecting your identity. Sorry, just noting that someone got unpinned. Are we still good to go? Test, test. Sorry, I'm not seeing interpretation right now. Are we good to go? Okay, perfect, thank you. Anyway, so COVID-19, um, if you do contract it, let us know. We'll let everyone else know. We'll keep your identity confidential. Um, and if you have any questions, concerns, or unaddressed accessibility needs, please just come find me or a team member from needs and we will gladly sort it out. All right, quick rundown of the event, just so you know what to expect. The needs section of our event features Elizabeth Moeller on opening remarks and presentations by Chloe godin and Katya Newman, followed by a discussion section where we get to hear from you, which no shade to my team members, you guys are really great, but I'm really excited for that section to hear from you guys. I'm also really excited for your presentation. Anyways, <laughs> um, so after a 30 minute break where we will hopefully eat some delicious pre-packed dinners, free food, love it. Um, we're gonna return for the SSD section of the event. 
So this is going to feature a presentation by Brooke and Kim. Hello. Um, and then it will open up into a panel with a ton of people that are so incredible. I won't even get into it right now. It would take all day to go through how cool they are. So skipping over that, we'll then have one more discussion section emphasizing you know, BC and Victoria specific experiences. Uh, we'll share some closing remarks and then we'll end around 8 p.m. your time or 11 p.m. back in Ottawa. I have an early bedtime back home. Power and through. Anyways, I promise I will actually hand it over to Elizabeth so soon. Um, but first I'm just gonna do not so much of a lightning round, but a good introduction of all the team members here today. Uh, so team members, please feel free to give a wave or shout, actually do both, that'd be great. All right, so the Needs Tour team today includes Elizabeth Moeller, research consultant. Hi. You are ready. Katya Newman, student awards programs director. Yeah, Katya. Uh, Sorry, I'm just gonna ask you to slow down a little bit on the introductions, because I have to fingerspell everything, thanks. Oh, thank you. Wow. Aliyah Petzak Grant, website manager. That's rough. Chloe Godin Jacques, research consultant. Alan Bridgman, IT enthusiast. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> All right, and me. Uh, I'm Carly Fox. My, name is. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, L. I am a queer, neurodivergent, and disabled student, needs communications and partnerships director, and I will be emceeing our event today. I'm sorry, you're stuck with me. Uh, so if you're feeling up to it, definitely say hi to the needs team when you have the chance. I think they're really cool. I'm super biased. Um, and just like most of you here today, we're also disabled students. One of my favorite things about needs. Okay, I'm done talking. Yes, I'm kidding, because I have to introduce Elizabeth, but then I'll be done, I promise. So Elizabeth Muller, pronouns she, her, L. Nice. Currently works for Needs as a research consultant, where she leads the Virtual Access for All project and writes its quarterly publication, State of the Schools. You might connect that that's what the tour is based off of. It's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, so she does a ton of other cool stuff, including her work as a doctoral candidate at Western University, where she explores how discourses and practices around direct funding shape access to services. Elizabeth, it is all yours. Thank you so much, Carly, for the introduction and for just in general keeping us on our toes. So good afternoon, everyone, or good evening or good morning, depending on your time zone. My name is Elizabeth Moeller, like Carly mentioned, and I'm a research consultant with NEEDS, and I have been for, gosh, about the past 10 years now. I'm actually joining you from my home in Toronto, Ontario, and I'm on Treaty 13, or Tuckeronto, and the little village that I live in, which is Bloor West Village, is actually called Tiagan, and I think it's important to sort of situate where I am. So welcome to the Victoria State of the Schools Tour Stop. Thank you for SSD, for supporting this event, and for being part of the conversation today. Very excited to be with you in virtual space, and a big shout out to the needs team, both on the ground and in virtual space. And thanks to you for joining us in person or online, because without you, there is no tour. One of the wonderful things about COVID and the way we pivoted is that we can make events accessible to a greater number of people thanks to technology. So it's really wonderful that we have so many folks online here today. We learned that we had to pivot during COVID and we've learned really that, that this technology is possible. So the National Educational Association of Disabled Students or NEEDS represents post-secondary students and graduates with, with disabilities, focusing on advocating for full access to post-secondary education and all aspects of campus life and access to financial aid to make obtaining higher education possible. We know that attending post-secondary education does come with greater expenses when you have a disability. That's just the reality. These could be expenses related to attending conferences and needing a subject. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Okay, go, go. Can you go on to next 
Info of the new beginning, I would take a moment to discuss our death. My entire life is born with a beginning that goes above that of the king we live No, you were walking. Then you'll go back. Thanks. I'm taking this dark pink and third is dark pink. Dark, dark, and 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 Black and the black cock is white. Okay. Um. Okay. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm the clock in a fourteen minutes. I'm sure to get it. We went in a fourteen five nine. I done this is for him. The thing that we can do this. But actually, I'm not here with the other at the game. And last year, we went to go to the bright dish of idea in other at the game. Can you go back, Colleen? I have been your name is. To go with my corona on the end. I am very identity. This is what the most important thing I'm going to do. My dad, as a wife, is that this is the mentally dignified. That I benefit from reason and reason, generated and determined by presenting me and universal indigenous disabled women as well as to severe. I am also not that we are the people as in this community based in entrepreneur and disabled children with our identity that in dealing with one another. The diver learned and lived his experiences on process and the decision he took in agents that I am with as a duty and the lesson of in this curriculum related to my. For instance, we are deep and understand concepts such as information and disability causes of each of my academic and my employment for and that is in that incredibly for 
probably use as this and garbage tends be more as delivery as the rest. Sorry. Thank you. I want to emphasize that <coughs> the that the big thing to accessibility is ability and intentionality of complex and making uncomfortable and there is no way of addressing the topic. That being said, I will try to find the answer to the whole dialogue on where we can set nothing and then together. Sorry. Thank you. I think that I did something to get I would, I am interested to know something. Please consider participating either by raising your first story and also hope that function on Zoom or in any way in person. So I don't see or if yes the earth I find them idea and if so on the what content. No. But if there's anything in this chat. No, but if there is, I will let you know. Yeah. What to be done? Thank you. All right, just a quick time out. Um, Chloe, could you repeat whatever an audience member says just so we can get it interpreted? But what is the your um for your um just for the sake of interpretation, um when we have an audience member speak, I can say it back here just so we can get it interpreted by ASL. Yes. Do you know? Going back, I just the I just I don't think do you want to repeat? You want to repeat your awesome contribution? The first three letters stand for inclusivity diversity and equity. Thank you. Anyone else to go with Okay, okay, thank you. You think of okay. so yeah, I is it a common of the I don't think that they are. Okay. 
um, idea is that I find it that I like the need to develop in my garden, but maybe if I did this so that they can clean with it, then they think the reality of both with the darker and quality is a I I 
decision making and decision making processes. Fine. Thank you. Um, I also have many more choices by agency individual location and policies for to learn also diverse and intersectional experiences and to disseminate this knowledge to others within the community in every way. By going to a position in individual can begin to recognize and challenge systemic inequalities so that labor is not imposed upon individual and equity delivery community dependent with legal experience continuous systemic inequality. So if we in mind that this is a place to this, I would like to pose a few questions. So what is currently being done in the hand of Asia within your higher education? Learning within your higher education institution. I'm going. Ooh. All right. Hannah Brown has a question. You'll say it. I'll say it back. Yeah. Go. Um, so it's not like a more thought of mine is that um, a lot of what I see um, from what I'm seeing is here is sort of by individuals and not by mm. systemic, but by society, but not um, by the institution itself in looking at things in the way of I think Time for an aggressive summary of that. Um, Hannah said that idea is often done by individuals and not often by organizations. That kind of nice. Thank you. Yeah, that's very nice. Um, anyone else? We can, yes. Oh, all right. And just for interpretation, so building off what Hannah said, um, a lot of the time students are almost protecting idea from their institutions. That that's very interesting. Thank you for that. Anyone else before we move on? To the next question. Okay, thank you. Um, what are some examples um, of cases that I, yeah, what are the examples of 
I'm wondering about the medical model of um, accessibility services and the fact that students with disabilities register for a service and must provide, in most cases, medical documentation to uh, validate their, their need for um, and receipt of the services. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, Lee, I'll give you a quick opportunity if you want to unmute and share that yourself, or I can read out what you said in the chat. You have three seconds to respond. Thanks for laughing, guys. Thanks for uh, sure. Um, I just wanted to, but one of the, an example that comes to mind of a practice that is not as inclusive as it could be here um, is that our Center for Accommodated Learning uh, requires like up to date paperwork proving your disability before you can access any of the services. Uh, this can be problematic for youth or high schoolers who've had their ADHD, for example, or um, other diagnoses or the paperwork for their diagnosis. <laughs> not in the last couple of years before going to university because quite a few disabilities uh, show up not in your last year of high school. Um, so having to liaise with your doctor or um, otherwise provide paperwork can be a poor start to first year um, because if you don't have your accommodations in place before you start, um, sometimes it takes a couple months to set up and then you don't start with the first, like with a good foot. Uh, if you are like first generation or like have never been had a family member going to university, you may not even know to start the paperwork before you get here or that you can. I could share a related story and um, I have to get a new diagnostic like diagnosis out of pocket because I wasn't an adult marital diagnosis, so I was 17 years of several To summarize what Hannah said, and it's it kind of sucks. Um, Hannah had to get another dyslexia diagnosis out of pocket. And those things are super expensive um, because they got it before they turned 18 and they were 17 and 10 months at the time. Kind of messed up. Thank you for sharing me and I know it. I'm not even, I'm just going to crouch for this camera at this point because we got another, we got, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. 
Thank you. Can you be my person that says that? I'm kidding. You're very busy. You have a lot of things going on. <laughs> okay. So thank you again so much, Chloe, for that. Um, thank you for letting us know. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Okay. Anyways, um, thank you so so much, Kaya. If you want to start making your way up to the stage, because it is it is a trek. This is a big room. I'll move I'll move this camera around at some point. I'll show you. It's it's a very pretty room. Thank you, SSD, for booking it. Um, but thank you so much, Chloe, for that incredible presentation. Uh, disability is so often excluded from EDI initiatives. It is counterintuitive and it's just completely disgusting. I'm sure as disabled students, most of you can relate because. It's weird. It's a weird feeling. Anyways, so we will now have a presentation from Katya Newman, Student Awards Program Director, Logistics Wizard, and Honorary Travel Agent, up to present on these super cool and awesome financial aid programs. Katya is a resident of Halifax, Nova Scotia, East Coast represent, uh, and in her final year of a master's in grant writing and program evaluation from Concordia University, Chicago. Uh, she enjoys educating audiences on the accessibility and inclusion related highs and lows that come with navigating life using a guide dog or as I call her colleague star. Yeah, this I made a minefield out of the stage. That's on me. We're gonna do another awkward pause. Let's attach a mic to my coworker. Hi. Where's the presentation to okay? Let's start with the clip. This one? Um, and then there's like a little mic attached to the pocket or okay I can clip it onto like the top of your pants if that works we are so close <laughs> okay tap into the mic perfect test 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 oh, good. good I'll just get out of your way though You're good to go, Kaya. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, so today I'm just going to chat a little bit about um our NEEDS National Student Awards Program, uh, which is uh, currently accepting applications to its uh, 2023 uh, program. So if we could be on the first slide with content. You got it. Okay. So the NEEDS National Student Awards Program launched in 2007. Um, these are tuition-based awards that are paid directly to post-secondary education institutions to defer the cost of tuition. Um, between 2007 and 2022, um, we have distributed 687,000 dollars of uh, financial assistance to 228 students across the country. Um, the program has grown to include seven different award types, ranging from $1,000 to $10,000. Um, and it's the current, as I mentioned, the program is currently accepting applications. The application period opens March 1st, 
um, with applications being accepted till May 31st. If you can go to the next slide. Um, we have seven different award types that we distribute. I'm just gonna give a little bit of an overview of um, each of them. So as we have our Canada Post Award, which is given to a student who displays uh, community leadership. Um, this scholarship is valued at $10,000. <laughs> 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 very, very uh, grateful for our partnership with Canada Post. Um, we also have our Accessible Media Incorporated, the Robert Pearson Memorial Scholarship. The scholarship was named um, in memory of AMI's um, first uh, accessibility officer. Um, there are two of these awards given out each year, um, each valued at $5,000. One is given to a student in the English community, and the other is given to a French um, student. Um, new um, this year, oh, well, It'll be in its second year at this point, but um, is the Connor Clark and Long Financial Group Scholarship. Um, Connor Clark and Long is a um, is a uh, firm located in Toronto, um, and they are offering this scholarship to a student studying a program in a business related career. Um, then we have. Our Needs National Student Awards, which are valued at $3,000. Um, the number of these awards that are given out yearly varies uh, depending on the amount of available funding. Um, and our remaining three are each $1,000 and our um, Memorial Awards. And so we have Holly Bartlett, Memorial Scholarship and the Christine Nieder Memorial Scholarship, which are both named in memory of um, two of Needs past board members. Um, the Christine Nieder uh, Memorial Award is specifically given to um, a student who is studying at the graduate level. Um, and finally, we have the Memorial Scholarship for the Visually Impaired, which is given to a student who identifies during the application as blind, partially sighted, or deafblind. And um, that is funded by a group of private donors uh, in Manitoba. We can go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, here we have the program eligibility criteria. Um, so applicants need to be Canadian citizens or permanent residents, need to have a permanent disability. Um, there's no other restriction uh, related to that. Um, and um, need to be enrolled in full-time studies, which as per our um, criteria is taking 40% of a course load. And that's kind of the same designation as the Canada, Canada Final Financial Assistance Program uh, uses in terms of disability and full-time enrollment. Um, speaking of that slide, yeah. Um, I just wanted to provide a little bit of an idea in case anybody is um, uh, interested in applying of kind of what the process looks like. So it involves providing your contact info and school or program info. Um, you'll be asked to provide either proof of enrollment letter if you're currently completing a program or a letter of admission. So um, uh, students transitioning from high school um, to post-secondary are eligible uh, once they've received a letter of admission. Um, we um, have applicants complete something called an academic good standing form. And this was uh, intended to replace um, the prior emphasis on uh, grade, grades and um, academic performance. So just basically 
uh, supplements, providing a transcript to make the process less ableist. <laughs> um, you'll provide an academic or a community reference. And the, the major bulk of the application involves answering four questions on topics related to your self-advocacy experience, your um, academic and career goals, um, your extracurricular involvement, and um, ideas you have on how to make media more accessible. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Yeah. yeah. And I just wanted to give a shout out to um, one of the fantastic resources that NEEDS has um, called Disability Awards. Yeah. And uh, Aaliyah, who's here today, is the fantastic uh, uh, main producer of that website. Um, so disabilityawards.ca is uh, the largest directory of um, scholarship and funding um, information and opportunities. Um, I believe the going rate is that we, at most points of the year, have about 300 or more um, scholarships listed on there, and those being like a combination of um, federal, provincial, and like private, privately funded. And there's also a lot of super helpful information there on um, basically anything um, post-secondary funding related, um, such as like navigating. Um, navigating the provincial and federal uh, loans programs and such. Yeah, and that is all for me. I, I just read this page. I don't know why I did that. Thank you so much, Kaya. The mic. Please hold. Hi, Kaya. I really like your presentation. Oh, we're good. We're good. Everything's fine. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was efficient. Give it up for Kaya. Kaya. It's me and this tiny mic against the world. Uh, Aaliyah, any chance you can screen share the Victoria slides, discussion slides? Cool. Slay. So we have 17 minutes uh, left until the break, which nice. Um, and I was hoping we could have this time to have a bit of a discussion section, just based off of you know Chloe and Katya's presentations. I have pre-made questions, but based on the community engagement I saw during Chloe's awesome presentation, I feel like you guys just have things you want to say about idea, about financial aid. Uh, so before I even get into the questions, I just want to open the floor. If anyone has anything to say, I, I will take this tiny mic and I will come up to you. And I, I might run. Well, I read for this, if that makes that make more sense. I don't just hate running, which is valid. You hate running. Oh, Leah, that's that grand. Oh, yeah. Alan, can you stop the recording? That's good, that's good. All right, so thank you for returning and welcome back to the NEED State of the Schools Tour Victoria stop. So before the break, we heard from the NEED's team on inclusivity, diversity, equity, and accessibility, IDEA, and our financial aid programs, and we heard from you. Uh, so now I am so beyond happy to turn it over to the UVic Society for Students with a Disability, but first I'm gonna do a lot of talking. Um, not like I need to tell anyone here, um, about SSD, but this thing does go up on YouTube. Uh, so I want to let people know everywhere about how cool you are. So the SSD is an advocacy group for UVic students self-identifying as having one or more disabilities with the goal of reducing barriers in all aspects of student life and promoting full inclusion in academic and social environments. Uh, as most of you know, they offer a range of programs and events, including a food security program, community care week, funding support, book club, peer support groups, speaker events, and panel discussions like the one coming up, community outings, and more. 
as needs partnerships director, whenever I get to meet with newer disabled student groups, they often ask like, what should we be doing? Who's a good example? And I say SSD every single time because that is how cool they are. They are literally exemplary. Um, so yeah, I hope everyone here already knows how special SSD is. Yeah. Um, but if you don't, this is really gonna click it in for you. So we'll now hand it off to Brooklyn Kemp, Education and Administration Coordinator of SSD for a presentation on their organization. Um, a bit about her when we get set up, that was in my script, but she's right next to me. For the people that aren't on Zoom, you may see your shadow. So anyways, um, a bit about her, Brooklyn is an autistic, anxious queer working in public and academic libraries who is passionate about early literacy and accessibility. She also has an 11 year old chihuahua in her feed. Incredible. <laughs> Here it is. You're good. Here. Yeah. Here's the belt, and then we're just gonna go in the pocket. Yeah, it should be this far. That's your screen. Have fun. Hello, everyone. Thank you, uh, Carly, for your introduction. Um, so, uh, as she mentioned, I am the education and administration coordinator for the SSD. Um, and if we could skip to the next slide, thank you. So um, Carly already gave a beautiful summary as to who the SSD is, um, but I'll go a little bit more in depth. So uh, who we are, part one, uh, above all, the SSD is an advocacy group within the University of Victoria Student Society. So we're for, the SSD is for any student who self-identifies um, as having one or more disabilities and or chronic health conditions. Um, what I find to be really important here is the distinction between us and Cal um, and that we don't require any medical documentation for you to be a member of the SSD. Um, if you feel like you are part of our community, then you absolutely are. Uh, we aim to support students um, and reduce barriers that are faced by disabled students in all aspects of their student life. Uh, and we also promote and advocate for full inclusion within academic and social environments. Who we are part two is a, uh, this is the makeup of um, who actually uh, works for the SSD. So, we, the SSD is governed by our council, um, our wonderful chairperson, treasurer, student liaison, graduate student representative, and general members at large. Um, in addition to the council, there are three staff members. So that includes myself, as well as our office coordinator, Adrian, and our communications and research coordinator, Bella. And then we also have some amazing students who are also who are our work studies. So that means that they uh, get hours to uh, work with the SSD while they're studying. We have three different work study categories and two people in each category. The SSD is located in the Student Union Building. Uh, we are in room B111, so if you're familiar with the Student Union Building, uh, we're, the closest landmark would be Cinecenta or Munchie Bar, and we are down the hallway. Uh, we also have a respite room in the Student Union Building that anyone can book um, if you need a private place to relax, take a nap, um, have a Zoom meeting, uh, do an online class, take a doctor's appointment, whatever it is, that room is there for you and it is quite cozy. And then we also have a huge online presence as well. Uh, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, and we have our website um, where you can find out all kinds of things that we're doing. So the bulk of this presentation is uh, discussing what uh, type of work the SSD does. So I'm gonna start with programs and services. And we have weekly, monthly, and semesterly uh, programs. 
Things that happen weekly are the campus stroll, evening games night, um, body doubling, which happens in person and online, as well as afternoons. I think we just need to switch interpreters. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so the end of the uh, weekly programs is the body doubling, uh, which students find so helpful. And we also have crafternoons, which essentially is making crafts in the afternoon. <laughs> uh, every month we have a movie night. We also have peer support groups and workshops. And semesterly, um, I put, Food security part one, uh, we'll get to part two in a minute, but part one is the Good Food Box program where students can register um, to receive a box of fresh produce um, in various amounts uh, delivered to the SSD or delivered to their home every two weeks during the semester. And that also includes a supplement of a dry food box that the SSD puts together so that folks have kind of the staples in their kitchen or pantry. Man, I put a lot of text on the screen, but we're gonna go through it together. <laughs> um, so we also have different funding opportunities at the SSD. Uh, we have a bursary for students who are Cal registered um, so that they can access learning assistance programs, um, including things like tutoring and note taking. We have the food security part two, which is a grocery reimbursement program. Uh, the grocery reimbursement program allows either individual students up to $200 or students that also have dependents up to $300 of uh, reimbursement when they submit receipts for food, um, including groceries, food delivery, uh, that sort of thing. And then we also have a funding policy where uh, the SSD can help support students in purchasing objects that will um, improve their life as a student. So some of those objects um, examples are um, an e-bike or uh, noise canceling headphones, um, really anything that helps accommodate them uh, and make life as a student easier. We also have a few events that happen. So we've done clothing swaps, a baking night. Uh, we're going to the board game cafe in April, which is tomorrow. <laughs> the board game cafe isn't tomorrow, but April is tomorrow. Uh, we also have events that happen in collaboration with other organizations. So we've gone to the Bouchard Gardens. Uh, we've done another board game cafe and a holiday feast. And then there have been some workshops as well. So upcoming is the self and community care workshop. There's also been neurodivergent study tips and an introduction workshop for Cal and academic accommodations at UVic. In addition to offering programs and services, a lot of what the SSD is here to do is advocate for students. So our advocacy work includes campaigns and outreach, as well as one-to-one -one advocacy with students who may want to, um, or who may want assistance speaking with their professors about any disability or accommodations, 
um, navigating those conversations can sometimes be difficult. And so we're here to kind of help mediate and guide those conversations and also just offer support. Some of the campaigns that we've had um, include the Access for All campaign, uh, which this presentation is also uh, part of. We're gonna have our Access for All panel shortly here. We've also had an invisible, invisible disabilities campaign and a dynamic disabilities campaign, which went really well. Um, and we've created a community understanding for UVic students in terms of what invisible or dynamic disabilities mean to them. We've also had the strolls for reproductive justice, and that also led to an interview series um, with different folks uh, to discuss what reproductive justice looks like for disabled folks. We also do a lot of outreach for the SSD um, just to get uh, students aware that we exist and we are here to support them. So that includes tabling, poster campaigns, social media, um, and also a poster sale where we uh, have some beautifully made posters from Bella, our communications director, and um, they're quite fun. I have some here if you would like to come and take a look at them in person. And we can move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and we also have some collaborative campus advocacy. So part of what makes a community strong is building relationships across campus. The first um, one here on the list is AIR. Uh, AIR, so which stands for Advocacy for Inclusive Recreation. This program was uh, founded by advocate by the different advocacy groups in the U UVSS, uh, and they've put on events and have um, made programming uh, that focuses specifically on creating an accessible environment for students to come and try different recreation programs like rock climbing um, or swimming. We've also been part of the Sexpo with GEM, which is the Gender Empowerment Center. Uh, it was a week-long um, pos sex positivity event, and that also included a sex and disability panel. And upcoming is a uh, CARE campaign. Um, so first we have a self and community care workshop, pardon me, um, and then we'll be collaborating with the Students of Color Collective to uh, do a video campaign about what it means to care for yourself and your community um, across our different advocacy groups. So we've done a lot of work. We are doing a lot of work and we will continue to do a lot of work that is very fun and exciting for our students. Um, so some plans for the near future include a creating a disabled artist coloring book. Um, we all know that we like to color. And so we thought what better way to um, kind of fuel that joy than creating a coloring book that is made up of different designs from disabled artists, either in our student community or um, just the local Victoria community, BC community in general. We're also looking at uh, creating uh, an autistic mentorship program, as well as partnering with the Intercultural Association's Disabled Newcomer Program. Uh, we are hoping to revive the book club for the SSD um, and make that uh, really comfy, cozy space, low stakes where folks can just come together and enjoy books um, with a disability lens applied to that. And then um, the last thing here is we're hoping to create uh, some disability professional development for post-secondary instructors. 
um, because as we heard earlier today, um, instructors don't always get the support that they need in order to then support students. So if we're able to help close that gap, um, then we feel like we'll, students will be set up for success. And that is all for me. Um, so thank you so much. If folks have any questions or want to get in touch, I have a bunch of email addresses there. <laughs> really though, uh, if you send an email to that first one, uvic ssd at uvic.ca, um, you will get in touch with at least one of the staff members in the office and we can help answer questions or just chat if that's something you wanna do. And you can also come find us in person. Thank you. Such a big fan. <laughs> I like your work. They said you're so good. I do. So fair. I'm not even. I'm not even gonna attach this. Um, and I'm sitting up. That that that's better. That's a lot better. Oh yeah. All right, so thank you so much for that presentation, Brooklyn. Uh, I already knew that SSD is super cool and does incredible work, but once we get this event up on YouTube, like disabled student groups across Canada are gonna get to see it for themselves. And that is just super, super exciting, um, even inspiring. And I don't use the I will a little, little disability joke in there. Um, anyways, so it's another, um, well, everyone gets set up. Let me introduce it, but we're set up. Um, so I'm now going to transition to a panel from UVic SSD featuring a ton of disabled students and professors here at UVic and highlighting their super powerful Access for All campaign. This is the part of the script where it says, well, everyone gets set up. Great. Um, if you're a panelist, if you want to turn on your camera, do it. If you don't, I'm not going to make it. Um, so your moderator today, I'll do some introductions. This is going to be great. Your moderator today, whoa, here they are, Izzy Adachi. Director of Campaigns and Community Relations for SSD, who are student panelists are Julia Denley, a neurodivergent and queer student leader and disability advocate living with multiple physical and mental health disabilities, and the chairperson of SSD, and Emma Levins, a disabled queer student here at UVic who is very passionate about accessibility and loves the work she does. We're joined by Hannah Brown, um, who is treasurer of SSD, as well as a PhD student here at the Department of Anthropology, where they are a teaching assistant and sessional instructor, a very busy person. Um, now onto our professors. We're joined by Christopher Wilmore, an associate teaching professor here at the Department of Economics. James Naka, a professor in the psychology department and cognitive and brain sciences program, the director of Different Minds Lab and founder of Different Minds Academy and an elected fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. We also have Lindsay Dupre, a Métis scholar, community organizer, mom and auntie, as well as an assistant teaching professor here at the School of Public Health and Policy, where she teaches entirely a volume of Chicago so cool. Uh, she's a co-founder of the Mommy Project and co-edited the text Research and Reconciliation, Unsettling Ways of Knowing Through Indigenous Relationships. This is such a jam-packed panel. I'll, I'll just, I'll just like get into it. Can you go? Okay, hey, feel free to put that on too, if you want. Sure, yeah. And then this can go in a pocket or just flip on. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, there you go. Perfect. And I'll see. We'll see. We'll just see. Perfect. And then here you go. You can move this however you want. You can say you can stand. And is it helpful if I have my um, um hi folks? My name is uh Izzy Adachi. I am the director of campaigns and community relations for the Ubic Student Society, um, which is the um, I guess organization which uh encompasses all of the other advocacy groups. Um I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I'm a neurodivergent and queer settler here. Um, and I'm just so excited to be moderating this conversation and uh, learning from you all. So, the camera up. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, this says to ask all the panelists to introduce themselves. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, we're going to start with the price. That's who's first on the list. Oh, 
Sorry about that. I didn't recognize my own name there. Okay. So I'm Chris Wilmore. I'm an associate teaching professor at the uh, Department of Economics, as previously mentioned. And relevant to this panel, I do have multiple disabilities. And so my experience and my answers to questions will be informed by that. Um, that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Um, Lindsay. I am very grateful to be spending my Friday evening with you all. I'm uh, connecting tonight from Southern Ontario. So this is where my family and I have been uh, living. This is where I was born and raised. Um, and we're actually moving on Sunday to Treaty 6 territory to Saskatoon. And so I'm three hours ahead of, of most of you. And so it's a, a late evening, but um, this is exactly where I want to be. In addition to being an assistant teaching professor in public health and social policy, um, as was mentioned, I'm also a community organizer. And um, I'm most excited about conversations like this where we can um, link our work to broader justice movements and um, particularly to bring attention to intersections between um, different movements and people doing different work. Um, I live with um, multiple chronic health conditions and so I would uh, identify myself as someone who has an invisible disability. Um, but even in sharing my bio with you all, I'm realizing that my own relationship um, to disability and to finding my place in um, the disability justice movement that I care so deeply about is constantly evolving. So thank you in advance for everyone who's uh, part of that journey with me and invited me to be a part of this conversation. Yeah, thank you for being here. Um, next on my list is Jim. Hi, my name is Jim Tanaka. I'm a professor in the psychology department here at University of Victoria. <clears throat> well, thanks for allowing me to come. I'm really excited to be here. My area of study, is I'm a cognitive psychologist, so I'm really interested in thinking and learning. And um, I run the Different Minds Lab because I think, you know, no two minds, no two brains are created the same. And uh, I, I am just fascinated by the way uh, different people learn. And I've, um, I'm here to learn from you all about ways that I could uh, teach better and more uh, to offer different ways of, of learning. I think uh, we have such a fantastic uh, technology now that allows us to uh, reach uh, students in so many different ways. So um, I'm here to learn. So thanks, thanks again. Um, next up, I have uh, Hannah Brown. Um, who is just... All right. Hello, hopefully folks can hear me okay. Uh, I see signing, so that's a good start. So, um, hello everyone, my name is Hannah, my pronouns are they them. I am a PhD student here at Lubbock in the Department of Anthropology. Sorry, the camera's just gently moving out of the way. Um, I'm also a uh, teacher in many ways. I am a teaching assistant consultant. I'm a sessional instructor at BIU this semester. And when I do finish my PhD eventually, I do want to be a full-time professor. Um, I am here today as I am a queer, um, trans plus and disabled person. So I live in my intersectionality and that's one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about accessible and equitable higher education. And um, apologies for being a little late, they decided to put moving trans history forward and my post presentation at the same time. So I'm multitasking today, but it's great to be here with everyone. Thank you so much. And you actually arrived like right on time. You, I, I was like, have one more person and then they have to come. And then you. <laughs> um, next on my list is Emma. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Emma, and I am a history student uh, here at UVic. Um, I'm a disabled and queer student, um, and I've been with the SSD on the council and involved with Access, Us, Access for All for. Um, I think about a year now, and yeah, I'm passionate about accessibility and um, access to online and hybrid learning options, and uh, 
super excited to be here. So thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Um, and last but not least, we have Julia. Thanks, Izzy. Uh, yeah, I'm Julia Denley. I use she and they pronouns. I'm the chairperson of the SSD right now and have been involved in like various capacities with the SSD for I think around three years now. Um, I'm also a disabled undergraduate biology student here at UVic. Uh, I'm joining from the Coast Salish territories of the Kikite and Coquitlam First Nations right now. Uh, I'm a queer and neurodivergent settler and I live with multiple physical and mental health disabilities including neurological complications of a genetic connective tissue disorder, which leaves me mostly bedbound. So that's why I'm not on camera. And I appreciate that the SSD community is always so understanding about that. And yeah, I'm just looking forward to chatting with you all this evening and sharing my perspective as a disabled student. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Julia. Um, I'm gonna get you to keep your mic on, hopefully, because the first question is for you. Um, and then it's gonna go to Emma. Um, so the first question um, is, in what ways did education during COVID-19 change your experience in higher education? Thanks. Yeah, I forgot I was the first to answer too. Um, yeah, so I think the switch to online classes uh, made my experience in higher education a lot more successful. Uh, in fact, I'd actually had to take time off of school leading up to the pandemic as my health issues had gotten worse and in-person classes were just untenable for me at that point. Uh, so I was able to return to UVic, which was wonderful, and it was really the first time like, in my life, honestly, that education felt accessible to me, and I realized that previously, like, the majority of effort I'd put into school hadn't actually gone towards learning. It went into trying to, to manage my health issues while I was on campus, and then dealing with flares from forcing myself to get to campus and sit through classes. And then if I didn't get to campus, trying to track down whatever material I'd missed or having to wonder if like the notes I'd gotten from someone else were comprehensive and accurate. And then with all the classes going online, I could actually devote all of my like, limited energy into engaging with the course material. So that was phenomenal. And I didn't have to choose between missing class or making my chronic illness worse. Uh, and one of my diagnoses is MECFS, which some of you may be familiar with as it's gotten a lot more media attention during the pandemic, uh, as it's very similar to long COVID. Um, so with MECFS, you have a limited energy envelope, as people often say, and basically pushing past your limits can actually shrink that envelope in the future. So years of pushing myself to try to get to class in person had like really reduced my overall capacity and energy and getting to save that for studying and attending online class was groundbreaking for me, honestly. Uh, so I could also focus while attending online class a lot better since I could do so from like the comfort of my bed or a zero gravity chair, rather than being unable to focus in person, uh, like due to things like pain or feeling really dizzy or nauseated. And then in terms of attending online, I went from being a student with very poor in-person attendance to attending them pretty much perfectly online. And I realized I'd internalized the sense of being like a flaky or an unreliable person when really I'm able to be very consistent when I'm provided with accessible ways of engaging with school and with other activities and meetings and all of that good stuff. Um, and as great as the, the shift to online course delivery was for me, I'll be honest that it also came with a lot of grief, um, just realizing that simply having access to even just recorded lectures would have enabled me to graduate a long time ago. And it's really hard watching those accessibility games getting clawed back over the last year and a half. And I really hope our panel discussion tonight helps to highlight why we need to continue providing online access to folks. Thank you for sharing that. It was definitely radicalizing to see how uh, accommodations just rolled out at that beginning of the pandemic, but disabled students have been asking for these accommodations for years. And so um, next up, it's the same question, which I'll just repeat, but it's going to be um, Emma answering. Um, so Emma, in what ways did education during COVID-19 change your experience in higher education? Yeah, thanks, Izzy. So um, for me, at first, uh, transitioning to online education was actually quite hard, and I missed um, being able to go in person, you know, see my friends, be in classes, and so on. But um, as the pandemic went on and as these online things went on, um, I slowly became more disabled and my health issues got 
worse and worse and worse. Um, and as that happened, I learned that doing school online worked so much better for me. Um, and as Julia had said, I also have uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, ME, CFS. So I learned that doing this online was so much easier and more accessible as I didn't have to try to go to class in person every single day. And that would take all my energy up and I would have no energy left for uh, doing my actual schoolwork. Um, as well, like this was a time in my life where I was dealing with some really bad PTSD from an event that had actually happened on campus. So having online education allowed me to still attend my classes without having to go to campus and deal with triggers, which is something I know a lot of students have actually experienced. Um, yeah, so as Julia also said, I'm kind of, I'm kind of repeating a lot of things, but uh, I wish that we still had these online options as they made school so much easier for myself and for so many other disabled students. Um, and yeah, I hope that our panel kind of sheds light on why Access for All is such a needed campaign uh, today at UVic. So Emma, how has your life changed since the shift from online course delivery um, back to in-person learning? Totally forgot that I was answering the second question next. <laughs> Um, yeah, so with the lack of online course options, especially here at UVic, it's been really hard for me to continue to work on my degree, um, especially now I actually live in my hometown, so I do not have the option at all to uh, attend in person. Um, but when I was in Victoria, I have lots of dynamic disabilities, so, uh, you know, disabilities that change from day to day, so I was, it was very hard for me to attend in person. I was losing a lot of attendance marks. I was being left behind in course content with many professors not recording. Um, but yeah, yes, uh, basically online delivery methods that were introduced during COVID were kind of suddenly ripped away from a lot of us. Um, and myself and a lot of people were really left with uh, barely any options to attend post-secondary. So uh, yeah, uh, it's been a lot harder for sure to get my degree without having ample online options available to me. Totally. Um, Julia, same question. How has your life changed since the shift from online course delivery? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, to be frank, it's been quite rough. Uh, many of the courses I need for my degree are fundamentally inaccessible to me now, and it's frustrating knowing that online access, like I said, was made available when, when abled folks needed it. And now I, as a disabled person, struggle to get online access, even as an accommodation that I have clear medical documentation to support. Uh, it makes me feel like I don't belong here or that UVic doesn't want me to belong here, which is also hard to reconcile with the fact that when I can attend things online, I'm an A plus student and I feel like I, I and like other disabled folks should have the opportunity to attend class in a way that, that works for us. Um, but yeah, since everything went back in person, I've also made myself a fair bit sicker just trying to get to campus for in-person exams. And then that makes it a lot more challenging to stay on top of my studies. But then even after the exam, I'm dealing with the lingering health effects from those days I had to get there in person. Uh, but that said, I've been quite lucky to find some professors who record their lectures consistently, though I will say that it's kind of involved me taking classes outside of my degree program to find something to engage with that is recorded. Uh, but I, I really appreciate it when profs record the lectures, and uh, it would be great if UVic made that information available too when you sign up for classes. Um, but yeah, I'd like to think that more profs would record their lectures if they recognize some of the barriers that disabled students face when it comes to in-person classes, and not just disabled students, but parents, caregivers, folks who can't afford to live in Victoria, which is particularly common these days, uh, international students, or just people who need to work on top of school, sometimes working multiple jobs. Uh, and when I watch your recorded lecture, I can show up at a time of day when my symptoms aren't as bad. Uh, I can be in a position that reduces my chronic pain and my neurological symptoms. I am able to absorb what the professor is saying and actually learn. Um, but with in-person classes, like by the time I'd arrive in the classroom, I'd be really nauseated from being in so much pain. I'd be dizzy because I have dysautonomia. And just generally, I'd be feeling so unwell from getting to campus that it would be really hard to focus and with my connective tissue disorder like even just walking from the parking lot to the classroom I'd have often partially dislocated multiple joints and just not be feeling like in a good headspace to to just start learning and focusing uh, and then during the class I'd feel worse and worse and just be like counting down the minutes until it was over hoping I didn't pass out or do anything that would disrupt other people's learning and 
rarely would I be able to actually absorb any of what the professor was saying just because I felt so crummy. Um, and then it was even worse if I had to, like if I had back-to-back -back classes across campus and then had to rush to get to the next one. And I think a lot of profs like want their students to succeed, but don't even consider that students like myself and students who are facing these kinds of barriers exist and that we're capable of doing well academically when we're accommodated. And not only are we capable of performing well in school when we're accommodated, but we can bring unique perspectives that add value to our academic environment. Like many post-secondary institutions uh, really like to pride themselves on having a diverse campus community, but there are apparently limits to the kind of diversity that they're looking for. It can often feel like that. Um, but I will say that with UVic having installed the Echo 360 recording technology, it's easier than ever for profs to accommodate disabled folks like myself who really need the recorded lectures. And like even just letting someone zoom into a class uh, to listen can make such a big difference for accessibility. And I know that disabled students aren't a monolith and there are of course disabled folks who prefer to learn in a physical classroom. But I think disabled students with access needs that include online course materials really deserve to be accommodated and included as well. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, and thank you both for sharing your experiences. Um, I think that's a pretty good uh, way to segue into our next question um, for uh, some of the educators in the room. Um, and the question is, how do you make your classes more accessible for everyone? Um, and so I'm going to pass this microphone to Anna. Um, hello. So when I'm teaching, I use a concept called universal design for learning, um, which is a very simple concept that is we start when we design our course, when we design how we're going to teach, how we're going to assess, um, and all of those things with looking for accessibility from the start. It's like when you design a building, you design the ramps and elevators in the first place without having to put them in later. So I really focus from the beginning on how I'm gonna make things more accessible. Um, for the class I am teaching this semester, um, it's an online class. Um, it was originally meant to be in person but because I'm not physically located in Nanaimo where the university is, they were able to make that change for me which seems kind of ironic because they probably wouldn't make that change for their students. Um, but it's now an online class. Um, I record every lecture and all the ass assessments are online via um, their version of Brightspace, the online learning platform we have here at UVic. Um, and then I also allow a lot of flexibility. To me, flexibility is a really key thing. Um, and not making people have to explain or justify why they might need that flexibility. So if people ask for extensions, I'm usually happy to give quite convenient extensions for most people. I have people who ask for, oh, I have this midterm this day and this can you do this next day? Can I have like an extra day on that? And I'm like, have an extra three days. You know, we we need to teach treat our students with kindness because they have a lot going on. They're not just in our classrooms, they're in multiple classrooms, having their own life, having work. Because most of the students I know work as well now because it's just not possible to do it without. Um, it's about considering what I would want if I was in their position. And I know that as I am currently a disabled student, but also I won't, won't lose that when I'm no longer a student. Those are some of my, my thoughts. Thanks so much, Anna. Um, Jim, uh, same question. How do you make your classes more accessible for everyone? Oh, well, thanks. Um, well, it's it's been so um, informative for me to hear everybody's um, comments about um, how rough it is to be in person. And I think the uh, sort of, you know, silver lining of COVID was that it forced us all to go online. And so... Um, I know the university is kind of pushing faculty to be in person, and that's fine, but it doesn't have to go at, uh, be at the expense of online. So all my classes are hybrid because I don't, I don't think there's a difference. I mean, the when you go when you um, the the biggest challenge is um, to make 
I, I, so I teach a research methods class. It's 125 students. And I want to make sure that I'm delivering the highest quality uh, education as possible. Uh, so we all had two years of practicing Zoom. So I got pretty good it was Zoom. And then the challenge is how can you deliver that same uh, kind of in-person uh, uh, lecture um, and, and, uh, and, and a hybrid format with Zoom? And it's easy. I mean, all you need really is a good microphone and Zoom automatically, you know, you record all your lectures. It's easy to upload it to the cloud. Um, the other advantage I think we discovered with Zoom is sometimes people don't, you know, it's hard to unmute yourself and ask a question, but you can throw a question in the chat. Um, that's easy enough. And I think the professors can, you know, if they're monitoring the chat, can uh, respond to that. Um, so I don't, I don't know this. It's almost a rumor that we're, you know, I, I, who who said that we had to be completely, you know, I think we can be in person. Nobody uh, uh, would argue with that, but it doesn't have to be at the expense of um, online. So especially when I hear some of these comments, how diff. So I, I got to the point where I think I, it might be a little too strong, but it's sort of, I mean, who gets what kind of what kind of student has the time to be in person to take the bus to come to campus to just for one class a day? Come on, you know who's got that kind of time? And you know, I was it was really interesting because we had you know single parents who would come to the lecture and we'd see they show their babies on Zoom, so we always share with that. Uh, I teach a graduate course. Uh, it's a smaller course, and it allows grad students who, one of the grad students is in Toronto, the other one's in Montreal. I have several students who are actually local here to Victoria, but they prefer to zoom in, and that's fine. I will say the one difference, though, is for people, for small seminars, I, you know, it's kind of nice to see people in person, but that's like a bonus. Um I don't think it compromises the intellectual content. So I polled all my, I, I did a poll last um, Monday of my 125 students about whether or not, you know, would they prefer to go back to just exclusively uh, in person, exclusively online or hybrid. And every single one of them said hybrid because then you have options. Who... <laughs> I don't, I don't get it. I don't, and so I think there should be, you know, be nice to because I think this is the future of education. So I don't think, you know, you know that, that I think you'll see universities who offer this option and they're the ones, I think they'll have a lot of students who, who are begging for this because you can offer quality instructions um, uh, uh, in a hybrid format. So that's my, that's my takeaway. That's my takeaway from COVID. So I, I actually don't think I'll ever be exclusively in person again, uh, unless my chair or dean says I have to. It's a pretty good takeaway. Um, same question for Lindsay. Um, how do you make your classes more accessible for everyone? Yeah, thank you. You know, I feel spoiled in a sense that um, I face less challenges as a faculty member because I'm teaching in a school that pre-pandemic was predominantly online. So our Bachelor of Arts in Public Health and our Master of Public Health um, have you know, been online before the pandemic. And the majority of our courses are also asynchronous. Um, which has been done for a range of different reasons, including um, you know, meeting students where they're at um, in terms of their careers and being able to work at the same time. Um, and, you know, I've enjoyed collaborating with my colleagues, um, including Natalie Frenzen, who's um, oh. talked to me, talked to us a lot about, um, you know, as was mentioned, universal design learning um, and thinking about how 
our our whole lens on our programs can um, be guided to reach students, to care for students, to shift, you know, what it means or what our goals are um, within post-secondary education um, in establishing relationships and building community um, through through our courses. So I'm I'm really grateful that I'm able to be within a school that um, feels like a good fit to me in terms of what our values are um, and how we're, we're thinking about student experience and also faculty, staff, and uh, sessional instructors as well. Um, and to bring in another lens, in addition to UDL, um, for me at the heart of my pedagogy is trauma-informed approaches. Um, because I think, you know, Emma mentioned about experiences that some students have um, on our campuses um, and, and trauma-informed pedagogy really um, is centered around this um, understanding that, um, you know, we should always be prepared and just assume that there's some level of trauma that students are bringing to the classroom and to view that also from a lens of resilience and how the structure of our courses and the design and the values of our schools um, can respect that and, and acknowledge that and try to do things differently so that they're safer spaces. I get really um, uncomfortable when I'm in a space and it's, you know, it's just asserted that, well, this is a safe space. Um, when post-secondary environments are not uh, safe spaces for a lot of people. And so for me in trauma-informed teaching, it's really um, striving for safer spaces and, and trying to create um, a community in a classroom where, um, you know, acknowledging that I'm still holding a different level of power in that room by being a, a professor, um, there can also be, you know, shared responsibility and uh, accountability around how we can maintain those safer spaces. And so, you know, within that trauma-informed approach, I'm thinking about safety. I'm thinking about offering control and choice as much as possible, um, collaboration and building trust. Um, just to give a few specific examples, because I think it's really important things like this, especially if we're trying to influence others to take up this work, to give some examples. So for me, um, uh, at the beginning of a course, I like to do a course opening survey um, in, in most of my courses where I'm getting a feel for, you know, who's who's in that room every time you could teach the same course over and over again, but who's in that class will change how um, you should approach it or, you know, that's how I try anyway. And so getting um, giving students the opportunity to whatever extent they feel comfortable because you have to build trust to share with me. Um, privately what uh, or how I could best meet their their needs um, in the course. Also, you know, using that as an opportunity to see see their interests. Um, for me, thinking about accessibility and trauma informed approaches isn't just about that damage centered uh, lens. It's also about the that resilience and those those strengths that are coming from people's uh, diverse experiences, having diverse assessment formats and options so that students can choose different um, ways of of demonstrating their knowledge um, balancing content formats so for me in my asynchronous courses um, I try and and weave in some synchronous components that are delivered online but um, you know not forcing students to turn on their cameras um, inviting people to show up in the ways that work for them that day um, depending on their energy depending on what's going on around them and then um, with that as well, you know, when I'm doing pre-recorded lectures, um, uploading them not only with video format, but also with audio as well, because um, some students have um, guided me to understand that even just that screen time and, and even myself with, um, uh, with some of my conditions, sitting in front of a screen and on Zoom for a long time can be very challenging. So how can we incorporate audio in there um, differently? Um, just two more that I want to add before I close is, um, as was mentioned, flexibility around deadlines, um, but not just being flexible after the fact when people are in you know situations that they need accommodations being upfront about my ethics in the space and how um, for me i'm committed to that care and creating you know building that trust so that students will communicate with me and um, look for support before they're 
oh, ideally like in a desperate need. And then lastly, I think it's part of building relationships with Cal staff, with other instructors and staff within my school and seeing it as my responsibilities, not just being to students in my classrooms, but I can have an impact on supporting other faculty and instructors to carry that work out as well. Yeah, so as I mentioned, I do have multiple disabilities and that informs my teaching and that just instinctively I try to design the course that I would like to take as a student to the accommodations that I just think are common sense and sine qua nons. And uh, that includes, for example, uh, in my in all my courses, I have live lectures, whether those are online or in person, what I'm able to teach in person. But those lectures are always also recorded. And the recordings and lecture notes are uploaded as soon as possible onto Brightspace and kept there permanently. Uh, even students even have access to it after the course closes. And I notice a lot of students actually go back to them after the course closes. And um, also, as you might have noticed, because I missed my own name at the very start of this segment, captions, especially live captions, are very important to me. And so when I lecture on uh, via Zoom, I have PowerPoint live captions on. Now that I'm going to be transitioning back to teaching in person, I'm going to be trying out Otter AI, which was pointed out to me by, by people uh, in this group, which is a live transcription service that allows for uh, that allows for my words to be turned into text almost uh, almost immediately. Flexibility regarding deadlines is also important, but so is fairness to all students in the course present and future. And so I, I deal with this in two ways. One is that in all of my courses, every single student in the course gets an automatic mental health, what I call a mental health voucher. It's really a one use, three day, no questions asked extension that can be used even after the fact, as long as, of course, it's within three days of the deadline. And I found that this relieves a lot of pressure on students, even students who end up not using it at all, like knowing that they have that cushion there, that they are not trapped if uh, things should happen at the last minute. And then, of course, I also work with students individually to see whether they need accommodation or help before the deadline, because ideally they would obtain an extension that is appropriate to them and fair to all other students in the course before, um, before the, the deadlines. And those extensions are customized uh, to the students. Different ways of learning are important. I explain things in one way, but students may not find that way, may not find that way um, works for them. So students tend to look things up on YouTube. So I do that for them. Instead of, instead of having them hunt for hours for a video that explains the same thing either in a different way, I spend a few uh, a half hour or a few half hours looking through and finding videos that I know are high quality and explain things in a somewhat different way than I do, just in case the way I explain it doesn't stick. And I also include curated articles and case studies and so on for that very same reason. And finally, as I also about mentioned, I try to include in my assessments uh, things that give students a voice and a choice and a stake in what they are doing. If students can find a way to make the course to find to make the course material relevant to their own lives and to their learning styles and to their capabilities and abilities, well, that tends to improve learning. Uh, and that's all really I have to say. Well, thank you. I wish you were all my professors. I don't know what degree that would be, but uh, going back to students, um, how, and this question is going to be for Emma and then Julia, how do alternative course delivery methods reduce barriers for students? Yeah, uh, so alternative course delivery methods, um, such as online or hybrid classes, they can reduce barriers uh, for all kinds of students, but um, they allow people with dynamic disabilities that, you know, change day to day or people with disabilities that um, don't allow them to attend in person, um, they allow them access to higher education. So these alternative course delivery methods, they allow students to attend school in whatever capacity they can and whatever capacity they want to. So you know, if somebody wants to attend in person or that's that's easier for them, like that's awesome. And if someone prefers to attend online, 
why should there be less options for them just because that is what works better for them um also like i think it's been mentioned a couple times but um all kinds of students do benefit from alternative course delivery methods it's not just disabled students so we have international students we have students who work full or part time we have uh, students with kids or caregiver responsibilities um, and even students who may not be able to live in Victoria due to the climbing housing prices, which I know is an issue for a lot of students right now. Um, and also, like as I mentioned before, um, online classes and recorded lectures can benefit students with PTSD. So especially students who may have had a traumatic event happen at the school, this allows them to still participate without having to come to the campus and cause their triggers. Um, in addition, like as I said, this is helpful to all kinds of students. Um, so if someone is sick, instead of coming to class out of fear of missing content, they can just stay home, they can rest, they can attend online. And then with that, they don't risk getting other students sick when they come. Um, also, so people with deferrals, these kind of things can help. So if a person has recorded lectures to watch, I uh, will make their completing their deferrals so much easier. Um, so yeah, essentially alternative course delivery methods can reduce barriers for higher education for all kinds of students here at UVic, um, and we definitely need more of them. Great. Um, Julia, it's the same question. Uh, how do alternative course delivery methods uh, reduce barriers for students? Thanks. Yeah, so I'll probably say a lot of the similar stuff to Emma, but I think it's okay to be a bit repetitive because I think it underscores how a lot of disabled students do have this experience or have similar views on this. So um, yeah, I think having hybrid or high flex access and recorded lectures can make a big difference for, uh, as folks have said, like not just disabled students, but other students who uh, struggle with getting to in-person classes or just balancing a lot of different responsibilities. And really, I think too, from a pedagogical perspective, anyone can benefit from being able to rewatch their lectures. There's this kind of ingrained mentality that I find in academia that lectures in higher education are this ephemeral learning experience where you have one shot to take in the material and if you don't then you're out of luck. And I think any student who is willing to spend time studying by reviewing their lectures and like improving their notes should have that chance and even for folks who aren't disabled, but uh, like everyone's still vulnerable to things like colds, flus, COVID, and it's better for everyone if people who are sick with something contagious can choose to attend a lecture from home rather than coming to class and putting others at risk. And I also think like ideally that we should do away with uh, attendance policies or mandatory attendance, but if those are still going to be a thing, then allowing people to attend online and counting that I think would be really important. Uh, but for disabled students in particular, alternative course delivery methods can not just remove barriers, but really be imperative to their academic success. I know that's true for myself, uh, but for folks living with chronic pain and chronic fatigue, not having to come to campus can make it possible for them to still participate in school while managing their symptoms. For folks with ADHD, learning from home can mean they can stim in ways to help them focus, like including ways that would be disruptive in a classroom, like path, uh, pacing or tapping. Uh, being able to rewatch a recorded lecture is also great for neurodivergent folks or anyone who has symptoms that can transiently impair their ability to focus. Uh, for people who are immunocompromised or even just living with someone who's immunocompromised, not having to sit in a classroom full of unmasked people during flu season and amidst COVID risk is a really big benefit. Uh, for people who have sensory processing challenges or who are sensitive to sense, uh, crowded in person classrooms can be overwhelming or even make them physically ill. And again, these folks really benefit from having that online access. And uh, this has been mentioned too, and Emma mentioned this, but another group of folks who can really benefit from online access would be folks with PTSD, and especially for anyone who's struggling with like hypervigilance in a classroom setting or on campus in general. Um, and I'll just give a brief trigger warning that the next thing I'm going to say will be related to sexual assault, though I'm not going to describe any details. And I'll just pause for a moment in case anyone wants to turn their volume down or, or not listen. But yeah, earlier in my education, I was sexually assaulted and harassed by a fellow UVic student and was basically just expected by UVic to be okay with going to class, not knowing if I would run into him, which sometimes I did. And that's even happened when I'd been told by UVic and then their classes weren't too close together and we like, probably shouldn't run into each other. Uh, and like through all that, my PTSD symptoms were 
significantly magnified by the way you've handled it and having to be on campus uh, and trying to learn in that environment. I'd, I'd be so stressed and on edge uh, in class that I, I just couldn't focus. Um, like, and there's plenty of research to show that high cortisol levels from stress are uh, known to impair learning. And being able to attend my lectures online during that would have made a huge difference. Uh, I ended up needing to withdraw from classes multiple times uh, because of that whole situation. It was really disheartening. Uh, so yeah, sorry for the long answer, but there really are so many barriers that are reduced by offering alternative course delivery methods. And I definitely didn't even capture all of them here. Thank you both for sharing on your experience. Um, I wish I could just download all of your takes directly into the administration's version. I, I try every time I talk. Um, so going back to the uh, educators in the room, um, what are some barriers that faculty face when trying to make their courses more accessible or when delivering courses in alternative formats? Mm -hmm. Oh, Lindsay, um, if you could go first. Sure, I'd be happy to. You know, when I was reading through this question and preparing, preparing for tonight, it came to mind that there's almost like two, there's two streams um, of, of people that are grappling with this. Um, there are faculty members and instructors who I think are on board and are committed to doing this work, who face, you know, certain barriers to, to doing it successfully. And, um, and there's also, you know, many faculty members and instructors who I think are still very much behind and may actually be resistant to doing this work at all and not and not seeing the value in it or um, not, you know, being willing to to invest um, themselves, their energy and their time into adapting their approaches and and it's not just a generational thing, I think, in our in terms of uh, career levels, I think, you know, it's evident across the board that there's different levels of, of willingness. Um, when it comes to people that are willing, um, I think, um, or actually, no, I'll go the other route first. When it comes to people that I think are just, um, they're not there yet in understanding why this is so important, um, to maybe put it more kindly, um, you know, there's issues of just even understanding what ableism is and the extent of it, the, the diverse experience of disabled students and faculty and staff that are part of our, our university community. And so I think that there's something there in terms of um, needing to be more um, intentional, I don't know, like EDI trainings are, ugh, that's a whole other can of worms. But you know, there's, there's a need for um, really expanding people's understanding of just um, how how broad uh, the impacts of ableism are and how that shows up in, in all of our classrooms and in our um, working relationships as well. Um, I think, you know, when it comes to people that are on board, um, there's lots of things going on and kind of getting in the way. For example, you know, I'm someone who's earlier on, I'm a more junior faculty member. So for me, pushing boundaries um, and trying to, you know, do things differently in a colonial system that um, benefits from ongoing settler colonialism, which is entangled with ableism, um, other racisms, uh, transphobia, uh, Islamophobia, you know, the list goes on of these interconnected uh, experiences of oppression. And so for me as a Métis disabled professor, um, pushing boundaries, you know, I use what power I have and do it in ways that um, I can, but I also have to be very careful and strategic in how I'm pushing boundaries differently than um, my colleagues who maybe are further along, who are tenured um, and things like that. So I think that's where collaboration between those of us that are committed to this work is really important. Um, it's also, you know, um, issues around deadlines to get super practical when it comes to being flexible with students we have to deal with some of the bureaucracy and the you know when i need to get my grades in by and and i you know i push that and i'm very fortunate to have a director that is quite flexible um, on her end as well uh, dr catherine worthington um and so 
I am quite supported, but I know that that's not the case in other parts of the university and where, you know, when you don't have that support higher up, even if you are, you know, committed to that work yourself, um, if you don't have the um, administrative leadership or the, the overall, you know, commitment then from your supervisors, your um, uh, people that make your life more or less challenging then it it gets in the way and then the last piece I just want to end on here is around um, yeah EDI as I said it is a can of worms but it's something that um, I've written about and that I'm you know deeply invested in um, exposing is that the surface level approaches to reconciliation work to EDI work um, more broadly um, are just not cutting it. And, you know, of course, there's respect for steps and, and change takes time. But I think sometimes um, EDI work and reconciliation work gets weaponized and it gets used as a branding mechanism rather than actual deep investment um, and openness to, to sustainable change. So how can we hold our institutions accountable for these, you know, things that they're committing to in their strategic plans um, and not let these movements that we're a part of be co-opted um, or, you know, appropriated. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm getting, I'm getting fired up because it's frustrating. And, and when you are deeply, you know, impacted and invested in this work, um, it's really discouraging to see these things be, you know, only, um, only invested in so far. Um, yeah. It's hard not to get fired up about this topic for sure. Um, Chris, uh, same question. What are some barriers that um, you as faculty face or you feel that faculty are facing when they're trying to make uh, courses more accessible or trying to deliver courses in alternative formats? Well, my barriers are a lot more prosaic and nuts and bolts. So, Many of the best approaches to accessibility, I think, should be customized to the particular person because disability covers so much and accessibility, even for non-disabled people, covers so much. But when you're teaching hundreds of students a term, managing a large number of requests with a fixed TA budget and especially as a disabled instructor with a limited amount of, of spoons per day, can be extremely challenging uh, to do properly. And that is tied to the second important barrier that I face, which is the, at least my instinctive need to remain fair to all students in the course, present and future. If I offer an accommodation to one student, I must, out of fairness, be prepared to offer the same accommodation to any other student, present or future, in observationally identical circumstances. And that is challenging, but also I can't see myself not doing that. But those two things together, those are the two main barriers. They're not very interesting. They're kind of boring, but they're also incredibly important and can be devastating in terms of time and mental effort and physical effort and just plain old bureaucracy sometimes. I'm fortunate in that those are the main barriers I face, thanks to a very supportive department, but more on that in a later question, I believe. Thank you so much. Um, Jim, uh, same question. Um, what are some barriers? that uh, faculty face when trying to make their courses more accessible or when delivering courses in alternate forms? Hmm. Um, I, I think it's just sort of silence on the university's part. I don't, I, I mean, we get mixed messages for faculty where um, we, we're encouraged to be inclusive, but I don't know if we get any practical training on how how to do that. And um, I find that um, sort of uh, discouraging. Um, so kind of getting back to some points made about these multiple forms of presentation. So I'm a cognitive psychologist. 
we study how people think and learn. There's lots of good re research to um, uh, uh, reinforce this idea of, of, of having like a video that you can review or at your own pace to slow it down and to replay it. Um, also to have our you know slides available. Um, the other thing that just I was just reminded of is that um, because you can do captioning now, that's that that opens up a lot of possibilities for this whole other audience too. So, um, so the barriers are, I think are, I, is 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 that the um, I think there there could be um, kind of workshops on just kind of harnessing existing technologies. Just, I mean, it's simply how do you set up your 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 lecture so it's hybrid? How do you know? Just basically buying everybody a microphone so they can plug that in, you know. And then, um, I, but I agree with Lindsay. I think I I uh, I, I do sense a resistance from some colleagues. Because I think there are some folks who really think the only way you learn is by sitting in a lecture. And I guess the one thing that I will say to preserve if, for hybrid is this kind of spontaneity, to be synchronous, to be present, to to engage with students. And that's the one thing I, I, I think, because there is also evidence showing that asynchronous does, isn't so successful. It, it's successful for good students. But you lose the students who are who are who struggle. But I think by making and engaging your students and asking them to be present um, uh, in your lectures has has gone. Um, that's what we do in our class. We do, it's not attendance. We just call it presence. Just show up. You know, you turn off your camera. It's okay. You can cook. You can do whatever you need. But if you're there, you're. If you're present, you're impacting the 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 classroom dynamics. Is is my feeling. So, sorry, I got kind of off track, but I'm a little disappointed in the university because I I don't think they've done. They've been silent, and so they need a little push. We all need a push. I need a push. <laughs> I definitely hear you on the university side, but. Um... I'm going to pass this question to you, Anna. Um, so what are some barriers that faculty are facing when they're trying to make their courses more accessible? Oops, thank you. Nearly lost the back of my Um, As you folks may have noticed that they have been looking at my camera, I've been nodding along with everything that's been said so far, um, and I definitely agree with all the thoughts we've had. I'm maybe since I'm last going to try and frame, frame this question differently and try and highlight some of the reasons why faculty and professors may not be moving towards accessible hybrid frameworks. Um, firstly, one of the main points is the addressing that ableism that is present in all institutions and colonialism in our own internal settings is uncomfortable. And people don't like sitting in discomfort. People like the status quo. They like doing things how they've always been done. And they don't like facing the fact that they might have not been doing the best for everyone. So I really think that some people avoid discomfort because they're not forced to face it. And this is why I think these conversations are so important for everyone, is that we allow people to sit in discomfort because that is where I believe a lot of growth can happen. Secondly, um, I don't know if students necessarily know really the job of professors and faculty, um, but it's not just teaching. So teaching is a small part of what faculty do. They also have research responsibilities. Um, there's a big thing in academia, publish or perish. You have to be constantly working on your research, constantly publishing, constantly going to conferences. And then there's also admin work and there's very cool service. So there is an expectation that Faculty um, will sit on committees, will be involved in community work, some kind of service work back to the university. And if you think about all those things and how many hours there are in a day, a lot of professors don't have capacity to do the change themselves. So a, a way I think we can really improve this is making it easier for professors to do this change. Um, one example of how we can do that is um, 
by providing them technology, like you mentioned, making sure these microphones are accessible. Um, the one we're using today is one that is available in electrical for any professor to use. Um, and making sure people are aware of that. Um, additionally, UVIC um, has uses Echo 360, which is a software that can be used to record and live stream lectures. It's available in over 100 classrooms. I can't remember the exact number, but even if it's not available on the computer in the classroom, you can use it on your laptop as well. Um, back in the fall of 2021, I, as a teaching assistant, was offered five hours of paid professional development time to attend workshops to do with this sort of software. So I've taken the workshops on this software and that was paid time that was protected for me. Whereas if professors wanted to attend that training, if that was time they had to take out of their own schedule. So I think it's really important for higher education institutes to carve out that time um, for professors because as happens with a lot of advocacy work, um, you see this in all uh, walks of life, um, BIPOC folks, indigenous um, isation initiatives. They're given as extras to professors that they have to do on top of everything else, rather than carving out space and resource for people to make the change. And so what I think you really need to do is to support and uplift everyone to have the time, to have the capacity and have energy to make these changes. Because I, I'm 99.99% of professors aren't doing this out of malice, they're doing this out of necessity. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so next question, and I think some of you folks might have already answered this, but um, it's going to go to Jim first. The next question is, how does UVic support faculty in creating more accessible classes? That's okay, it. yeah, I think, yeah, I, I think I can't. Um... I actually don't think it does. So I don't think you, I think we can do better. Um, uh, I think it needs, we, uh, we need a plan. We need um, um, this probably through the learning and teaching center um, a way. I, I, I think we're getting, again, faculty, we get mixed messages about this. And because, and, and quite honestly, I know the faculty association is giving some pushback on uh, recording classes as well. So there's there's lot, you know, like everything else, there's always politics. But I think if you can make a pedagogic argument, and I like I said, there's a lot of da data to support this, that hybrid is is the way to go. And I actually, and I, again, I think you got to bring faculty along. It's, it's um, eesh, you got to, you know, um, uh, convince people this, you know, pedagogically, this is really valuable. And also the thing about it is um, there's no downside. I think th that a hybrid format uh, is, um, um, you don't lose much, but I think there's a sense amongst old school faculty or people who have a very traditional view of how people learn feel that it, you have to be in person. So anyway, so I think the, 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 the uh, my, my takeaway from about you, Vic, is that they're, they're just kind of benign uh, neglect. That's a fair assessment. Um, and I'm gonna see if you have a different answer. Um, but you'll be surprised if I don't just answer no. <laughs> um, in the Two and a half years I've been at UVic. Um, those that know me know I've been doing a lot of advocacy work across campus. Um, and there has not been sufficient change. And if anything, um, for me, it's getting work sleep every month. Um, one of my real mentors um, in my teaching since I arrived at UVic was held the role in the uh, learning and teaching center at UVic. Right. here at UVic in the um, Director of Teaching Excellence um, and they were recently let go due to budget cuts um, and they were let go partway through a semester the class they were teaching had to be sorted out otherwise um, and it's a lot in the in the guise of budget cuts isn't in my mind doing 
what we need to do to, to get more students here? Why would you get rid of your director of teaching excellence if you want more students to attend? Um, and yeah, like I said, I already talked about FA360 and how we should be providing more training. Um, there's a lot of plans that you make. They have their Indigenous, in, I can't remember the exact name, but the Indigenous Revitalization Plan, the Strategic Plan, the Climate Plan. Um, I'm currently part of a committee that's working on an accessibility plan that is only happening because the BC government have finally said that we need one. Um, and the, the students who are on the committee, so me, Julie is also on this committee, um, and multiple other students, we are not reimbursed for our time on this committee. So again, it's another thing where people are expected to give extra rather than it being supported. Um, as with a lot of ad advocacy work, it's always extra. It's never instead of something else. Um, so I think UBIC has a long way to go. And I, I do say this a lot. Um, I bump into Kevin Hall, our president, quite a lot. And he's probably sick of my face by now. Um, but I, I won't give up. And I don't think we should give up. Um, and that it really should be changed because UBIT could be a world leader in accessibility if it wants to be that. I 100% agree with that. And I really found it really tough like, to like, see the iPad. So, yeah, it's very hard for me. Um, oh gosh, I completely lost my. Lost for the my interpreter, mind. if you can speak a little closer to the mic, I'm just not able to hear you, please. Oh, sorry. I was just wondering to myself. Um, Thank you. Um, how does you get to support faculty in creating more accessible classes? If at all. Is that for me now? Yes. Please. Okay. So uh, I have been extremely fortunate in the Department of Economics. The Department of Economics has been nothing but extraordinarily supportive of any measures I've taken to uh, <clears throat> try to increase accessibility in my courses. Experimental approaches have not only been encouraged, they have been actively celebrated. Uh, people have been very happy to hear from me when I share my things. Uh, I have been encouraged to find new ways to share uh, findings regarding accessibility, what works, what, was, what doesn't, so on. Even when I come across minor expenses that I would like help with, that has always been taken care of very well by the department. So in this particular case, there has been no real obstacle. And again, I think far from it. And I think part of the reason is because at least in the Department of Economics, it's uh, what one of the other speakers here is saying is, is seen that although not all instructors may espouse this way of thinking yet, there really is no downside. And given that, at least in economics, there is an idea that we want to be able to ladder courses and lectures on top of each other. Well, what happens if you are not accessible? You have these ephemeral lectures that vanish once they're gone, and yet you're supposed to build each lecture on the previous one. What happens if you miss lecture three out of 35? What happens for the rest of that? Well, I can tell you what happens. I don't have to guess because it's ever in my mind. Because in 1984, I was sick in elementary school during the day in which my class learned how to read an analog clock face. They sent the little worksheets home with, with my parents, and I did the worksheets at home. But because I was sick for that one lecture, I never recovered. 1984. It is now 2023, and I still have trouble reading analog clock faces. That is how devastating it can be. <clears throat> and it's not just people with disabilities that have to deal with dynamic disabilities. A lot of people live lives where the lyrics from Evita apply. Some days are fine, some a little bit harder. And so just a few of those harder days for anyone, disability or not, that you're not in a headspace in this world that brings a new atrocity every hour, when you're not in the headspace to pay attention to that lecture at that particular time, that could compromise your entire scaffold of learning by eating away at the foundations. And that's no good for the that's no good for a department that prides itself in its pedagogy and wants to be able to build on the stuff it teaches earlier on. And so I think that that's part of the reason that at least in the Department of Economics, 
there has been no pushback whatsoever and a lot of support for everything I've tried to do regarding accessibility. I'm, I felt very comfortable and supportive there, which I now realize is unusual. Lindsay, it's the same question. Um, how do you feel VIC supports faculty in creating more accessible classes? For me, I think what's on my mind is, well, what is UVIC or who is UVIC, right? Like it's easy to first interpret that question of the institution as a whole, um, but we have communities within this institution. And so for me, yeah, I, I agree with colleagues naming that, you know, it's not really happening in the ways that it needs to, to be that real, um, investment or that real commitment and understanding to what this work is and what it requires um, i don't think we're there yet however i do see a beautiful growing community of people who are trying to figure it out um, together humbly and collaboratively and and that's something that's really exciting for me um, and i see that you know i'm very guided in my work from indigenous feminisms and within the heart of indigenous feminisms is this um, desire and pursuit of pushing back against unjust power structures right and and so for me in my teaching and my service work and in my um, scholarship that's around you know trying to get rid of some of those hierarchies so so who is uvic to me that is uh, and who is doing this work and and fueling it with um, excitement and possibilities um, those are students those are staff who are often you know not uh, acknowledged for the great roles that they play in supporting us to even be able to try some things differently um, for me, I want to celebrate one of my colleagues, Doug, Doug Thompson, who um, supports faculty and instructors in PHSP in setting up our Brightspace sites and um, teaching us about all the different capabilities of Brightspace. By him doing that and spending that time with me so that I don't have to, you know, fumble through just doing a crappy job and not using these tools to their full capacity. Um, he's, you know, we're doing it relationally. He's sharing knowledge with me, I'm sharing knowledge back, and we're, we're doing it together so that uh, we can use these tools, um, as I said, to the best of their ability. Students as well, you know, um, our PHSB Student Association that has been led by Matsuko Friedland, who I, I think is on the call tonight, and Zachary Derrick, you know, their leadership and collaboration that I've been doing with them as a big part of my service work um, on co curricular learning spaces. You know, we've been thinking through these things together. How do we host events outside of classes that people want to show up and build community through? How do we, everything from a registration page, the questions that we ask um, to make people feel cared for, you know, how are we, how are we exercising care in all that we do and collaboration in all that we do? Because, you know, these institutions weren't built on care or collaboration. Um, and so if we really are going to do things differently, rather than waiting for them to change from the top down, um, that's important and that accountability needs to be there. But I'm most excited about that collaboration and thinking about who is UVic according to the relationships that I'm invested in and the people who are also caring for me. Wow, yeah, I really feel that. Um, I think that it's really easy to sort of just say like the institution doesn't care, but it's like there's so many people within this institution and I see so much care. And so um, thank you for that perspective. Um, the next, it's a really good segue into the next question as well, which is for anyone who would like to answer, but it's how can instructors and students collaborate to create more accessible and inclusive learning environments? And that's for anybody who would like to answer. I see Julia's looking at kind of an already glass. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start if that's, if that's cool for folks. Uh, yeah, so I think that I feel like the willingness to collaborate is the, the key factor here. So I think it's important for instructors to be willing to listen to students about how to be more inclusive and accessible, 
and to actually like consider them as valuable um, like people to get input from instead of having this weird power dynamic where profs don't respect things that they hear from folks who aren't colleagues. Uh, and then it's similarly important for students to be willing to share about what their access needs are or what works for them. But then with that, like internalized ableism can be a really significant factor that makes disabled students not want to speak up about their access needs. And it's especially difficult when like many of us as disabled students also do have experiences with profs who are dismissive or ableist towards us when we bring up our access needs or offer input regarding accessible course design. So totally understandable if folks aren't comfortable speaking up about that, but it, it's really helpful when people are willing to kind of share their lived experience to inform what a more inclusive uh, learning environment could look like. And I, I think there needs to be a commitment between professors and students, although with more responsibility on professors and also with the, the, the university honestly should bear the most responsibility, but to creatively problem solve access barriers rather than assuming folks with certain barriers just should be part of higher education, or I've also heard that uh, we should just be relegated to online only institutions. Um, so for instance, like recording classes that involved group discussion, especially group discussion where any kind of sensitive matters or lived experience are shared can be a lot more challenging than recording a lecture, but that's not an insurmountable barrier. You can record the lecture part of those classes and then zoom folks into the discussion, uh, share like notes that kind of capture the main points of the discussion minus any kind of personal things or lived experience that was shared that people wouldn't want recorded. Uh, I know there are profs who do that, but there are also many others who just refuse to even consider recorded lectures if their class involves a group discussion. Uh, lab classes pose an even greater challenge, I think, when considering how to include folks online. But again, if professors are willing to work with students to try to make labs more inclusive, then it would be possible to come up with some creative solutions to, to mitigate their access barriers. And also we at the Society for Students with a Disability are always more than happy to chat with any instructors who want ideas on how to problem solve accessibility barriers that uh, students might be facing or to learn about what those barriers might be. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I want to build off of his amazing point about building community um, into how we often see students and professors as different communities, but we need to build one collective community to really make this work happen. Um, I'm in a kind of unique, well, I'm not in a unique position, but in quite a lot of these conversations, I'm in a unique position because I am both teacher and student. I take on both those roles. Um, so I see both perspectives quite readily at the same time. Um, and it's really it's been really interesting for me how separate these groups are at times. So I'll have conversations in student perspectives and then conversations in um, teacher perspectives. But there's not often a connection between the two. And we've noticed when we do a lot of our advocacy work as the Access for All campaign um, with the Society of Students with Disability, sometimes we feel like my voice is more heard because I'm seen as a teacher, not as a student in those spaces. And that's really that's really difficult. And I don't quite understand why that isn't a community of being a safer space where all voices are treated equally and heard equally. And I really think that's an important thing that we should be working on. And just valuing when students do say something that we need to listen because it takes courage to say things. It's, it's, it's brave to say, you know, I have this access need. Um, and without, I don't want to make it sound like when disabled people put on a pedestal or look how great they are, not, not that kind of way, but in the way of, you know, they've, they've made the effort to speak, we need to listen. Um, and just connecting. And I do try to do a lot of that myself. I've got lots of allies of staff and faculty across campus, um, a couple of whom are in the audience, so be kind. Um, and I also have a lot of students who I found community with, um, disabled students across campus, but I often feel like I'm the only way they're connected and we need to do more connections there that don't rely on individuals because as much as I'm hanging around for a while for this PhD, I can't be here forever to be that connection. Thank you so much. Um, would anyone else like to answer this question before we move on to the next one? Julia, I don't know if your hand it is up because you have another thing to say or because it's just been like 
It is 100% a legacy hand. Thank you. <laughs> um, this next question is going to be for Lindsay and then Hannah, and then if anybody else wants to respond to it, they are free to. Um, Lindsay, how do commitments to disability justice and universal design learning intersect with the necessity to take up an anti-racist and anti-racist effort? Thank you for that. Um, yeah, oh my gosh, it's getting late in my time zone. So bear bear with me. <laughs> um, but this is, you know, this is what drives my work and this is what I'm most curious about. You know, how are these um, different commitments connected? Um, and how can we make space for all of them and see those connections without oversimplifying um, the unique circumstances and needs of of each lens or of each um different justice justice issue um for me within my my teaching because i use a trauma-informed pedagogy to really guide me and all that i do um that gives me the lens then to you know ask those questions about how people have experienced trauma differently in their lives based on like using intersectionality as a way to to you know consider trauma um and seeing how um how all of this is operating within you know a context of settler colonialism and so in my classes tying in history or like helping people to acquire the language um and some of that you know uh that those frameworks to perceive power dynamics not only in terms of like and, and make have, helping them make sense of it not only in terms of oh here are issues that we're covering as content in the course but to like talk about again our responsibilities to one another in a in a classroom um, and laying that out transparently um i've i've found that to be really important and i'm by no means perfect at it but um trying to find ways no matter what the course is that i'm focusing on to name those connections when they show up um, I, again without conflating them all um, but to to show those relationships because i think another challenge that comes up when we think about confronting ableism or we think about confronting anti-black racism anti-indigenous racism um, homophobia transphobia um, and you know those other oppressions that i'm i'm not naming right now um, is that institutions again through these edi lenses um and when resources are are you know being considered there's competition that comes up or it's like we're almost you know pitted against each other to to try and um you know name that we're more worthy or that we um yeah that we require more investment so how can we collaborate more and you know building on that idea of community building how can we show up for one another um, and ensure that whatever spaces we're in like if we're within conversations about ableism and disability how can we um you know bring in a lens of understanding colonialism and understanding how racism shows up alongside ableism you know when i'm in spaces as an indigenous faculty member talking about indigenization and talking about um specific racisms that indigenous peoples face how am i also ensuring that um, ableism is at the table so they they are all connected and uh, rather than just saying that they're all the same i want to say that they're they are very distinct but that there's opportunity for that collaboration and community building where we can show up for one another within these conversations thank you so much for um, that response um i know i said that anybody who wanted to answer this question could uh, i lied because we're all in so I'm going to pass the microphone to Anna, and um, then we're going to wrap up here. No pressure then, no pressure. Um, so I just want to start by naming the, in answering this question, I am a white British person, and I benefit from that whiteness and from colonial institutions through that whiteness. Um, but through my identities as a disabled, neurodiverse, and queer person, I've done advocacy work for all of my identities, 
and I've been doing a lot of learning about Indigenous um, reconciliation and indigenization. Um, I see I see a lot of overlap between what disabled people need, what BIPOC people need, what Indigenous people need, what uh, trans people need, what other queer folks need. But these advocacy work and this, these voices often exist in silence. And I really think we need to break this down because really there's a massive overlap there. It's not a, a, a complete overlap, but there is a lot of overlap. And I kind of dislike that the word accessibility is so often linked just to disability, because I'm not, not just talking about disability when I'm talking about accessibility. As people have mentioned, we want accessibility for everyone that might benefit from it. People benefit from being able to choose whether to go in person or, on, or go online. Maybe they have to look after their child or they have other care responsibilities. Maybe they have to work shift work and it's just easier for them to attend online. Or for whatever reason, they might not be able to attend. And accessibility is for everyone. It's not just for disabled people. Everyone has access needs. And I think improving accessibility in higher education improves the lives for everyone. And we shouldn't be treating things as silos. We should try to work together because together, I think our voice is completely amplified. And the more of us that are saying the same things, the more likely people are to listen. I think that was a as well. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna, I guess, I'll close this up and say thanks to all of our amazing virtual panel participants um, who showed up today. Thank you to um, SSD and Needs um, and anyone else who had any involvement in planning this. Uh, I, I didn't prepare something and so I kind of honestly forgot that I had to go this far. So. <laughs> I want to be real. Okay, that's on me. Be real? A be real. Oh my goodness. Yeah, we can we can be real. Okay. Well, um, I joked on Twitter. If you follow us on Twitter, if not, you should. If you don't have Twitter, you should get Twitter. So if you follow us on Twitter. I don't have it. Um, but does everyone here know what a be real is? So once a day, at any uh, at any time in the day, your camera will go off. Any time. Well, you get to take a photo. It's a prompt. Your camera doesn't just go off. Um, but my B-reel went off and I would like to take that now. For anyone who doesn't know what a B-reel is, I'm so sorry. Um, yes, Frank, please turn your camera on. Hilarious. This is what we were doing. Like, um, this is what it's all about. All right, my camera's on. Thank you, Elizabeth. Last chance, last chance. It's the two or B-reel. Three, <laughs> two, okay. This is Do what, it. This is what happens when you're on the Okay. Ah! I'll take it. Oh, it's shaking. Let me keep it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Anyways, now to do what I'm actually here to do uh, the closing remarks. I have to, oh my God. Every time. Okay. We've been having issues with the computer. Yes. I believe in it. I believe in it. Okay. We got interpreters. We're all good. We're ending the spotlighting. Cool. So I knew SSD would not get out of the park, like no pressure, no pressure. But um, honestly, like this work can be so tough. Like you, you really, like as disabled students, we experience educational ableism and just ableism in general, but having this community across Canada is just so incredible. And just being here with SSD makes the hard work worth it. Um, sometimes that includes five hour flights with arthritis. Um, or or 12, you know? Anyways, um, so thank you so, so much, SSD. Um, I am being selfish. I normally don't do closing remarks, but uh, who's gonna stop me? So uh, when I first met SSD, I was 19 and a research officer on a summer job here at Needs. Um, and while I was and still am a disabled student, I had never seen such a strong and vibrant disabled student community. Um, and so my first meeting with Julia Denley for our first ever State of the School Student Leaders Panel, which is, still available on YouTube, completely changed everything I thought I knew about disabled student communities and organizing. Uh, SSD showed me that disabled student groups, they aren't just a safe space or a community resource. They're an incubator for the future leaders of the disability rights movement, for future understandings of crip culture and crip care, and for the future of disabled students. Uh, I look forward to our regular Zoom meetings way, way too much, but like an excessive amount. 
um, but to be here in person in your community to talk to your students and be on your campus has been such an impactful experience. Uh, so thank you for having me and the needs team. Uh, thank you to the panelists for debunking all of these myths around hybrid accommodations that have contributed to the largest accessibility rollback of all time. Is that's what it is. Um, and thank you to our incredible participants for sharing your time, space, energy, and experiences with us. Four hours is a really long time. You'd think after five tour stops, I'd know that. Nope. Anyways, um, and thank you to the needs team who have been traveling across the country to make this whole event possible, this tour possible. Thank you to the captioners and to the interpreters for making this event more accessible. And thank you to Employment Social Development Canada for supporting the Virtual Access for All project. Um, this event has been incredible, but also just so exhausting. So I'm going to say goodnight. Please keep in touch. We have so many emails and social medias and websites. You cannot miss us. That's it. Thanks for taking a be real. We can stop recording. I can take off the mic. That's it. Oh my God, no. Anyways, that's it. We'll see you next.